Uh, I was among the, the first to be there in about 2012 and have seen the great work. It is just amazing. We want you to know about that because today we're going to focus on grace uh, to the world, how grace has come to us all as we wrap up this series. I want you to turn to uh, John chapter 3. I want you to turn to uh, a passage that we're going to look at today. Grab your Bible there in front of you. If I were to ask you, uh, what is your favorite verse in the Bible? I wonder what you would say. Uh, another question around that. What, is, what do you think is the most popular verse in the Bible? Anybody? What do you think is the most popular verse? Probably John 3.16, right? In fact, so popular, we probably know it in some form or, or other. So help me here. You know this verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his only or one and only, right, son, that whosoever, whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life or everlasting life. I can tell, yeah, I can tell what generation you're from, you know, the, the, the believe it and everlasting. And I like everlasting, by the way, um, because it, it leans towards not just eternal in time, but infinite in all of its wonderful qualities. And that's what, that's what it means, it's Zoe life. We talk about that often. But I suppose that millions, even billions of people have heard this verse and come to faith in Christ through this singular verse. Uh, and no wonder it's so popular. Uh, Martin Luther, the great reformer, said it is the, the Bible, it's the, it's the heart of the Bible in a single verse. It's the gospel in miniature, he called it. And, and I'm guessing that like me, it's one of the first verses you've learned if you know this verse it shows up everywhere still in our in, in pop culture it shows up uh, we all know or most of us you know know that chick-fil-a is god's chicken um, but what you may not know is just next door uh, over here, uh, on central expressway at in and out burger every paper product anybody that you that you get some of y'all go to in now, uh, yeah. Um, every every bag of fries, every under, under your cup, there's the reference John three sixteen. If you dare to go to Forever Twenty One in the mall, pick up a vintage T-shirt, whatever else. The bag you carry out on the bottom is printed John three sixteen. CEOs, Christians who founded these companies say, "Hey, let's just toss it out there." Let's just put it out there, create some intrigue. Some of you have seen it um, on athletes. I remember years ago, Tim Tebow, when he was playing at the University of Florida, he had on his, his eye black, he had, right, John 3.16. People were wondering, what is, what is this about? Pointing people to a singular verse that really proclaims the gospel. Some of y'all are old enough to remember, or maybe you've seen this. Uh, I know when I was a kid, there was a guy who showed up at all the sporting events. Remember the Rainbow Man? Anybody? Some of you aren't old enough to remember this guy. He made his way, like a parody on, um, gosh, on The Simpsons and an SNL skit. The Rainbow Man, he had a fro, he had an afro, rainbow fro, and he, every game he positioned himself with a sign that said, John 3.16. Am I the only one who's seen this guy? Okay. <laughs> Y'all can, can help me here. Um, but I, here, here's the thing. My point is this. That it shows up everywhere. In fact, maybe so familiar to us that our familiarity has again led to an unfamiliarity that has led to ignorance maybe about all that it really means and to contempt. To see the verse, know the verse, and then think less of it than we should. And today we're going to get underneath it. I'm going to spend a lot of time on John 3.16, wrapping up, as Brandon noted, this series on grace. So John 3.16, we're going to start there, 16 through 21, and we're going to see that grace saves the world. We're going to see that grace exposes evil, and we'll see that grace empowers good. So at our pastor's study on Wednesday nights, we have been saying, you can join us, come in and out anytime you want to, but we're looking at how to read the word faithfully. We always ask uh, what is the context? To understand a scripture, a passage, we need to understand the context that it was given in. The question we ask always is, what did the Bible say? What did this say? 
before we get to what does it say to me? And today we look at this little portion of scripture. It's called a pericope. I don't know if you've ever heard that before. It's a Latin term. Not just in biblical literature, but you find it in literature. A pericope, a Latin word that literally means cut out of. John 3, 16, it cut out of a broader teaching. And most of you know that he's speaking with whom? Anybody? He's talking to Nicodemus. We know his name. He's, he's, a, he's a seeker. He, he's wondering... He's so intrigued by Jesus. And so he's come to meet with him. He's a member of the Sanhedrin, not just the Pharisee. He is like legit, highly educated. He knows the scriptures as well or better, I could argue better than any of us. He doesn't know the rest of the story, though he's about to discover more of it. He memorized the five, the Pentateuch, the five first books of the Bible. Memorized the five books of the Bible. First five books. He, he un, uncovered, did all the commentary on all the Old Testament. Jesus is talking to him. He's courageous to even come to Jesus, though at night, some have noted, not that courageous, because he's stepping out of his own theological tribe, his own ideological security, his people. And he is, yes, he's afraid to go even talk to Jesus in the daytime because he might get canceled. That's why. Which is why some of us don't enter into these kinds of conversations. I've learned through the years, and I'd love to enter into conversations with other people who, who, who might disagree with me, not agree with what I believe. And wow, we need more of that in our day. We're either too fearful that we don't know what we believe, or we just want to attack from far away. We do this in, in our right, political I was going to say dialogue, lack of dialogue. Here, this man gives us an, a, a model, an example, and he steps into this. And Jesus cuts straight to the point, knowing that he has been on this massive works-based salvation plan. So he knows this going in. In fact, how about this? Apart from grace, that's all you've got. Every religion is us trying to be good enough, trying to get smart enough, to, to get to God. Jesus knows this. He steps in and he basically says in verse 3, uh, that's not going to work. You must be born again. There has to be a change in your life. And then Nicodemus asked the question that all of us would ask, how can this be? How, how are you born again? Jesus offers a story out of Numbers 21 that he would have known fully when the Israelites were being uh, bitten by these poisonous snakes and Moses is told to make a bronze serpent and he would hold it up and as he would hold up, hold it up, lift it up and they would focus on it, they would be healed, they would be saved. Jesus says in the same way, the sun will be lifted up and all who come to him will be saved. Not just the Israelites, but the whole wide world. So the first thing I want you to see here, grace saves the world. Grace has come to all of us. And even John 3.16 implies that we're perishing. Nicodemus knew that the world is broken. Something's wrong. And as we heard the choir and orchestra earlier, if, if mercy is us not getting what we deserve, if judgment and justice is getting what we deserve, grace is getting what we don't deserve, it's the love of God that's come to us. And here it is, verse 16. Let's say it together from the ESV. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Now, years ago, I got this verse on a, received this verse on a Christmas card. And, and on the card, um, it, 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 it explained almost word for word why it's the greatest verse. You may have seen this before. Superlative after superlative. I kept the card for many years. I don't think I have anymore, but I've memorized it. Probably tweaked it through the years. And this is what I want to do. I want to spend a moment breaking this down and see why it's the greatest verse. If you want to take notes, you can do this. For God, the greatest lover. You can say the greatest being. He is the great I am. And in, in saying, my name is I am, to Moses in the Old Testament, he's saying, you don't put a name on me. I am who I say I am. All the Egyptian gods, all the different gods y'all named and made up, 
You don't make me up. I am who I am. He's the great, the greatest being. He's the greatest one. But I'm going to say he's the greatest lover. So loved, God so loved the greatest degree. An interesting twist in this verse that I discovered this week, and we'll probably dive deeper into the, in the pastor's study. The first word in this verse, and when you look at the Greek, is not gar, which is the word for. The, word, the first word is not theos, which you know is God. The first word is a Greek word, hutos. Hutos means, we, we translate it often so. So it jumps over there. God loved the world so much. God so loved the world. But English, uh, kind of difficult at times, it's hard to translate. Even in, in English, the word so, which is why English is so difficult for so many to do so. Don't you think so? Um, it, it means many things. And here, there's a little twist that caught me. A couple of translations get it right, but very few of them. Hutos means thus or in this manner. Like, I will do so. I'll do it so. And that changes it a bit. Because on the one hand, it, it can tend to, to, to help us think that we're the center of all things. Like, like he, he just focused everything on us. The other is saying, God loved the world, all of us, in this manner. See, that's different. Now, it doesn't diminish his love for us, but it kind of offends our pride. It offends the mind to say, wait, didn't he do it all because of me? Didn't he do all of this because of me? And if we're not careful, that places us at the center of it all. I'd say it this way. God did not create us because he needed us. He needs nothing. Nor did he create us because he, he needed to love someone. Some have thought that. Now, I know we're putting on our theological caps here, but theology matters. You see, God is Trinitarian. Now, this is uniquely Christian. Watch this. He's Trinitarian. He's been in a loving relationship, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, this Trinitarian love relationship, in eternity past. If he was not Trinitarian, he would not be loving, eternally loving. Instead, he has always been loving, always in relationship. So he creates us, there's many layers here, in his image, which means he's created us for relationship. And yes, for relationship with him, to enter into that Trinitarian dance, into that loving relationship he invites us in. But he also then calls us to love one another and particularly to love in Christ, the brothers and sisters, to show the world a different kind of love. My point in all of this, again, it doesn't diminish his love for us, but in John 17, 24, Jesus said, I want them, that be us ultimately, to be with me where I am, to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. The Father has done everything out of his love for the Son. The Son has done everything out of his love for the Father. God receives all glory, not us. He came to rescue us to show even more so how great he is. We respond to his love, and in so doing, we just bring glory to him in everything we do. When we receive Christ, the rest of life is one big, we sang it earlier, hallelujah. One big praise be to God, everything we do. And if we really get underneath what Christ has done for us, and yes, this doesn't go into all that took place on the cross, that we're no longer justified through our own works, our own intelligence, or anything that we do, but because of Christ who's come to us. Grace is one way love to us. And when we continue to grasp what this means, I always say it, Lord, show me again how much you love me. Remind me again, because this is what drives our obedience in everything that we do. So the greatest lover, he's loved us with the greatest degree, self-donating, self-sacrificing, even enemy love has come to us in Jesus. And he's loved the whole wide world, the greatest number, 
that he gave the greatest act his only son the greatest gift that whoever or whosoever watch this the greatest invitation the greatest invitation to all people everyone is included this is that the greatest inclusivity whoever believes the greatest simplicity it's the, again the greatest inclusivity anyone can come because it's believing now this is where we get tripped up and I'm going to spend some time on on this one as we pause in the middle of this verse before it ends this is John's favorite word we see it 99 times in the book of John and I'll explain more what belief means in a moment but here's the rest of the story of the rainbow man His name is Roland Stewart. His life spiraled out of control. He was homeless for a while, ends up with committing multiple felonies. And now he's serving three life sentences in prison. The man that claimed to believe John 3.16. I don't know where he is in relationship with God, but I, I know this. You can know John 3.16 and not believe it. And that's what I want us to get to today. And we will. The humbling thing that hit me, as beautiful and wonderful as John 3.16, there are people in hell who know John 3.16. And today the great challenge is for all of us. Do you believe? Watch this. We'll, We'll parse that out a bit more. Believe in him the greatest person should not perish the greatest deliverance but the greatest difference from death to life from darkness to light as Jesus will point out but the greatest difference have the greatest certainty everlasting life the greatest possession that's why this is the greatest verse And then Jesus goes on. Watch this. He starts to then, he explains it. Verse 17. For God did not send his his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Jesus did not come for condemnation. He came for salvation. And and ultimately for sanctification and glorification. Look at verse 18. Whoever believes, there it is again, in him is not condemned but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only only son of God now we know in Romans 8 1 it says now if we are in Christ there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ I think it's interesting that he follows verse 16 with this now I'm not coming to condemn the world Because that's where we run. Watch this. That's where religion runs. If it's up to us to be good enough, it can lead to one or two things. If we get it right every now and then, whatever right is in our self-salvation program, we end up prideful. But most of us, I think that's what's going on with Nicodemus here, we all know. No, we're condemned. We're condemned by the light. We're condemned by the law. We know that we're not good enough. And so it says, whoever believes in verse 18. Now, I want to offer an illustration to help us understand this. Years ago, um, when I was doing student ministry, I read a story of a guy who, uh, his name, true story, of a guy named Charles Blondin. He was the first man in history. He was was a French acrobat. Um, He was a tightrope walker. In fact, he's still the standard. I don't know. Does anybody do tightrope walking anymore? I don't know. But he, he's the guy. And he, he's the first one to ever walk across uh, Niagara Falls. You may have seen that. There's still pictures out there of this. J- uh, June 30th, 1859. About 1,000 people gathered. Um, I'm not going to risk my life for 1,000 people. Sorry. But 160 feet he's up there. I mean, no, no television, you know, it's not for nothing. Just people gathering around. And he walks from the United States to Canada, 1,100 feet. 
This is a three and a half football field. This is a hike on on a tightrope, not a big giant, you know, big pole. You've probably seen this before. So he's doing this and he ends up doing it several times. People going crazy. He does it many times. In fact, I think he did like 17 or so times over his career then because that launched him into this guy. And so then he kept coming up all kinds of ways to do it. Um, he did it blindfolded. He did it with a guy on his back one time. Or not, not that there, but he, he's, he did it with a... Uh, he went out in the middle of the... Sorry, this is where I go when I'm studying um, for the sermon. But he goes out in the middle of the, of the wire, out there in the middle of the Niagara Falls, and he, 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 he cooked an omelet for breakfast while he's out there. He, he took a wheelbarrow across it. And the story goes that he, after he did the wheelbarrow, he says, how many of you think that I can do this again with someone in the wheelbarrow? And the crowd's like, yes! And there's a guy there at the front, like, yes! And he goes, how about you? How about you? Right here. And the guy offered an emphatic, no, not me. That's the difference. Believing is not an intellectual assent or agreement with a statement or with this truth. I believe John 3.16. It's not simply agreement. Believe, to believe is a verb. It's not a word like love that can be a noun or a verb. Faith. You don't faith someone. To believe is faith in action. And watch this. It's not simply agreeing and it's not just hoping. Now, yes, there's an element of faith. It's not just crossing our fingers. Last week over in Lake Highlands, we had a dad, another dad's pop-up. And we gathered together and a bunch of guys afterwards watched the cowboy game like maybe you did. Well, after the cowboy game, and we saw this throughout the week, all the cowboy fans, we now know after that game, we're going to the Super Bowl now. <laughs> we're going to the Super Bowl. That's what I've heard. Um, no, you hope you were going to the Super Bowl. That doesn't mean it's going to happen. Believing is not crossing your fingers. Believing is placing your trust in Jesus and his word and what he has accomplished for us. It's getting in the wheelbarrow. Now, if you're, if you're tracking with me, you're thinking, what does that mean? Like, how do I get in the wheelbarrow? Well, first, it's an act of faith. Before God, you proclaim, I believe. And some have done that and then just remain silent about it. Watch this. Jesus says, Keith mentioned this earlier. We've got baptism coming up next week. Jesus' first commandment, as we saw with sweet Kate and Julia, to come to say to us, I believe in Jesus. And I'm not going to hide out in the closet somewhere or just privately claim that I believe. I'm going to proclaim it to the world. His commandment to us is for us to come to him in faith and to be baptized. That's an action. That is belief in action. Another way to be, believe in action is to join the fellowship of the church. Now, I would say this. Every member of our church is a, a baptized believer. If you've not been baptized, I'm, I'm just challenging you here today. I know so many people who question their salvation, don't have the security of their salvation, and I would say spin out into what we've talked about recently, what's called apostasy, claiming to believe but never acting on it. And the first step, friends, is baptism. It doesn't save us. We don't add anything to what Christ has done. It's for us to say, I'm in. We start, when we act, we start to gain traction. It's what we talked about last week, John 15. Jesus said, if you do not abide in me, if you're not attached to the vine, you can claim all day long that you believe. And Jesus says, you do not belong to me if you don't remain in my love. And if the Spirit is convicting us today, we need to sort this out, friends. Eternity weighs in the balance. And we, in, in the coming days, as we enter into a series where I'll be preaching to the entire church family more than we imagine, to dream about the church that God desires us to be. And, and I hope you'll be here every, 
every week as I speak to the entire church family about what God is up to. And on the 22nd of October, we begin with, with Baptism Sunday, October 22nd, we're going to come together, all of us here, one service on that morning, pack this place out, our entire church family, and we're going to actually dream and envision what might, we, what might this campus look like in the days to come. I mean, exciting days. We're going to spill out with lunch on the lawn afterwards. I'm telling you all this right now, preaching the announcements, don't miss a day. Come next week and bring friends. And I'll close with this, the last two points here. Spending all of our time here on John 3.16. Do, do you believe? Have you gotten in the wheelbarrow? That's the challenge. But watch this. Grace saves the world, but it also exposes evil. Look at verse 19. And this is judgment. This is the, ju- the judgment. The light has come into the world. And people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light lest his works should be exposed. Now this is interesting. Jesus says in his coming to the world, he is the light of the world. And so light then, his grace, look at this, look how loving he is. Even in his grace, his love exposes us. The light of Jesus exposes our evil hearts so that we might turn to him. What a savior he is. We've said it before, some things grow in the dark, right? Fungus grows in the dark. Algae grows in the dark. Bacteria grows, moss grows in the dark. Sin grows in the dark. And this is a word for all of us. As believers, we say it this way. Uh, you know, we're, we're only as sick as our secrets. Which is why the scripture tells us to confess our sins to one another. It's why we have connect groups so we can do life together. And even there, go deeper and deeper in relationships and say, I need you in my life. I'm struggling. Friends, you know it's true. When you bring sin into the light, it cannot grow. It will not grow. When you wrestle it to the ground by the power of God and other believers in your life, this is what Jesus is saying. He's come and his light exposes evil for our good. And then finally, grace empowers good. Grace saves the world. Grace exposes evil. Grace empowers good. Verse 21, but whoever, there it is, does what is true comes to the light. Look at this. Whoever does what is true. Not who thinks or hopes, crosses their fingers. Whoever does, whoever acts on this truth and on the person of Jesus who acts on what he has said and what he's done. Whoever does what is true. How do we know what's true? Uh, There's a book for that. We know what's true because we're in the Word. It's why tomorrow, as noted, we're beginning throughout the Imagine series, we're reading the book of Acts together as an entire church family and friends. It's online. You can pick up your your, um, bookmark on the way out. It's in the commons, other places. Don't miss a day. And don't miss a week of gathering together as together we understand the truth. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. But whoever does not, he says, does what is true, comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out by God. Now, Jesus is referencing himself, but he's also referencing us. How do we know what's true? His word tells us. I've said it recently. If we really believe he speaks through this book, wouldn't we be obsessed with it? Like every day, wouldn't we be in it? Wouldn't we we'd be in it multiple times during a day? That is action. That's faith in action. And that only increases our faith. And I'll, I'll close with this. This past week, we were, um, gosh, privileged, honored to celebrate the sweet life of Dorothy McKnight. Dorothy was a member here for many years. She taught fifth grade, a lot of your kids. Um, she was just an incredible woman. I'm curious, how many knew Dorothy? How many knew Dorothy tonight? Yeah, a lot of us. I've known Dorothy for decades, a couple of decades or longer. Her, her, her kids, Lewis and Martha, were in my student ministry years ago. 
I was so struck. Um, this is the beauty of being a pastor, is to meet people like Dorothy through the years who grow more and more, grow, become more and more like Jesus as they, as they remain in him, follow him, love him, and express his love to others. Dorothy was that kind of person. So much so, she had this irrational kind of love for other people. And, and only those of you really knew her would, would know what I mean when I say Dorothy was peculiar. She was unique. She lived a kind of Pollyanna life. She saw the best in everybody. And she was optimistic about everything. Even in her last days in the hospital. Well, I'm going to go home soon. I mean, I don't know home, home, but I'm going home. Either home or home. I win. And she talked to her friends, many of you. I don't know if I'll see you again, but I'll see you when we get to heaven. It won't be long. I'll see you there. Always optimistic. Loved her family, everyone she encountered. When you met, you're the best person in the world. You're, you're just wonderful. I mean, even my kids, like on Facebook, I mean, to the end, she's on Facebook. And my kids are like, Dad, who is, who is this? Who's this Martha? Who is this? I mean, Dorothy McKnight. I said, she's a sweet, sweet lady in our church. She's commenting on all the, all the things. Your family's so beautiful. You look wonderful. God has blessed you in such amazing ways. She was just loving to the end. In fact, one of her uh, family members said, said she, she didn't live in our world. She lived in the world of Dorothy. <laughs> and I thought, she, she lived in the kingdom of God. On earth, she lived in the kingdom of God. We often talk about being exiles in Babylon living in a Christian colony or living as believers, light in the darkness. Dorothy lived that way. And my challenge for us is that God's grace, here it is, we say that it empowers good. It's his grace that empowers us to do everything. All of life is a response to what he has done for us every single day. And it's what drives us to love people like he loves us. Not condemn people, not put people down, not correct everyone. Just, I'm going to love you for free. And in so doing, I have faith that you're going you're gonna to see. My good works are going to point you to God. I'm bringing glory to God by loving you. Friends, we need more of that in our world, don't we? Let's live questionable lives. This week, when people see you, encounter you, that you will act, you'll do something of great love towards them, sacrificial love, and they'll question, why in the world did you do that? And at times we'll have the opportunity, as Dorothy did, even at the hospital, do you know Jesus? Do you know Jesus? Thank you for caring for me. You're wonderful. Do you know my Savior? We sang it earlier. I love to tell the story. When's the last time you told the story? Friends, it's time. As a church, I don't want to waste my life. You don't want to waste your life. Respond to his grace, even today. How will you do so? That's the question. How will you act? Because grace changes the world. Grace exposes evil, praise be to God. And grace empowers good. Let's pray together. I'm going to allow you just to pray before the Lord. Would you, what what are you going to do? Some of you need to receive his grace. Maybe even in this message, you've done so. Say yes.